Welcome to Huddle Up with Matias Bueno. Today's guest is football analyst for TSN, Stephen Caldwell. You've been involved with many different groups here developing youth soccer in Canada, and now I'm excited to chat with you today about all the different things you've done to help improve the game, as well as to maybe reminisce a little about the time that you spent being a captain for over two decades across the pond and here in North America. Thank you, Matthias. It's, uh, I'm delighted to be on. I'm looking forward to having a chat and uh, seeing where the conversation goes. First thing i got to get right off the table is Canada had the greatest results that the women's team or any Canadian soccer team has seen for that matter, winning gold to the Olympics in the most dramatic shootout that I think any Canadian soccer fan has seen or could handle for that matter. And they were really resilient. Steph LeBay was amazing in that she stood so tall in two shootouts against Brazil and Sweden when all hope looked lost in both of those games and then beating the Americans. How do you break down what went well for Canada and how they re were able to come together to finally bring, it, bring home the gold? Yeah, I, when I think about that team, uh, you know, recently after their success and, and, and probably in the ensuing years, it will always be the the togetherness, the grit, the determination that they, they showed. And, um, you know, it's a big thing for me. It's, it's, it's always the, the benchmark of truly successful teams to have that um, ability to get past moments of adversity and, and to succeed and to win. Because winning is, is so difficult to do, uh, especially when you're at a World Cup or an Olympics and everyone is so desperate and so determined to achieve that success that the one team that does is, is usually very special and exceptional in, in one or two areas. And for me, that team were exceptional when it came to resilience, grit, determination and, and, and teamwork. And they proved it uh, through and through. And so, um, you know, like really proud of them. And, I, you know, I know a couple of the, the women reasonably well. Um, and so to know them and know what they've been through in the last few years and their, their determination to succeed, it, it made it even more special. And most of us were at our televisions, the, the, the largest number, I think it was the largest uh, event that was viewed throughout the whole Olympics in Canada, 4.4 million people. So it shows you how many people were were glued to their box early in the morning watching that game and the the roller coaster they took us on, you know, it was, it was nerve wracking. You just kind of felt like one goal was going to be vital. And for Sweden to get it first, it was a bad omen. Canada equalised and then the, the to and fro and through the last few minutes and then into extra time was so nerve wracking. The penalty kicks sort of couldn't have went worse. And I have to say, when I saw their captain, the Swedish captain, I don't know her name, my apologies, step up towards that penalty. Um, I feared the worst, you know, I just saw determination in her face and then when she missed, I, I did think it was Canada's day and uh, and they deserved that. So brilliant moment for soccer in Canada and uh, a real seminal moment in, in most of our lives when we remember back. And the person that this is going to mean the most to, of course, is none other than Christine St. Clair, who's been the most amazing player for Canada in the world, you name it. She's done so many amazing things. And for her to finally get a gold medal towards the latter end of her, the latter half of her career, knowing how many times she's come close and the disappointment and the heartache they've experienced, what do you think this means for her as an individual player? Well, her greatest strength is that she she never concerns herself with the individual awards and the individual honours. And, and she's the reason that that team are so strong and all the things that I just mentioned, because she is the undoubted leader and she just preaches teamwork all the time. She has no ego and nothing selfish about her. And I think she proved that through the entire campaign where, you know, she's, she's not the player that she was in terms of how she plays the game. Uh, she plays that little reserve role and a little bit deeper these days, and she just is an out-and-out -out team player and and does what's needed to help her her team and her teammates succeed. And that's the strength of Christine Sinclair. It's it's uh, more than just the hundreds of goals that she scored and the the presence that she's had, the big moments that she's had. It's the fact that she uh, puts her teammates above herself, and that's what I admire so much. So I'm delighted for her. She. I mean, she's got to go down as the most successful women's player in the history of the game. She scored the most goals and now she has an Olympic gold as well as a couple of bronzes to her name. So for me, she's she's the most successful women's player 
that ever played the game. And it's amazing that she's Canadian and she uh, she loves her country and she's got so much to offer this country and the game of soccer in general. And there's no doubt what positive effects this could have for years to come with inspiring the next generation of young female players. And even with your involvement in a few groups, as we'll get into in a little bit, you know how important it is to have those people to look up to. And even with what they've done with the CPL and the, the partnerships with many youth organizations, it's just going to help soccer only explode in Canada more. And that's really what this country needs because as you can see with the men's team starting to pick things up and with what the women's team have done, it's about time that Canada's starting to really get recognition on the international stage. Yeah. For, for any sport to grow, you know, you have to have that aspirational, um, mindset or, or belief or vision, you know, and, and, and to have aspirational vision, you need reference points um, to, for kids to, to, to see amazing things happen. And so every boy and girl in Canada has a, a significant reference point um, from that Olympic gold and, and it inspires them. It inspires them to say, I can do that. I can be on that stage and I can uh, influence a nation like they did, you know? And so I think that it's very, very important. It's, it's uh, a new -ish sport here in Canada. I know, I know it's been going a long time, but this, the, the sort of trajectory and the, the, the success and the growth of the game has been substantial in the last few years. Even since I came here in 2013 to, to 2021, there's been enormous growth in the game of soccer. So, um, it's going to be massive, and and you know you, uh, it's tremendous for the women's game. Cannot deny that, but I think it's just tremendous for the game of soccer in general. I think that everyone, you know, sat at that TV watching that success has been impacted by it. I know I have, and I'm a, a forty year old guy who my career as a player has been and gone, and uh, you know I, I like to think I still have influence in soccer in Canada, but you know the the, the sort of influence it had on me is enormous. So. I can only imagine what it did to a 12-year-old boy or girl. So, um, yeah, sensational. So so happy for them and, and delighted that we've had that moment. And um, and it's up to others to emulate it now. It's up to other young girls or women to emulate that at the next Olympics or the next World Cup. And it's up to young boys and men to try and do the same at the international level of, uh, of the men's game. For sure. You've seen it before. Canada's had some sprinkles of success in international tournaments, but it hasn't quite translated into a long lasting foundation, unfortunately. And having spoken to a few other guests and particularly Martin Nash, who is a member of the 2000 Gold Cup victory against some of the biggest teams beating Colombia, beating Mexico. It was just crazy and thinking that that would be the turning point for Canada soccer or 1986 making the World Cup and them talking about how they thought that was going to help them go on a higher trajectory, but it wasn't meant to be at those, at those moments. But now we have a strong core with the men's team, the women, women's team finally getting over the hump. And you talk about, you may not be that young kid that's being inspired after you're watching in front of your television, but still had a big impact on you, even though your career as a player is, has come and gone. So there's no doubt that this will have a huge ripple effect in a positive way on soccer in Canada going forward. But I must ask you though, as a young lad, who are some of the footballers or teams that inspired you the most that really just made you fall in love with the game? Great question. Uh, I'll probably take 10 minutes to answer this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'll, ne I'll never forget. I need to start this off by saying that the first game I ever went to was, was Celtic. Uh, and I believe it was Motherwell. I should know the team, but it was a semi-final of a league cup in Scotland at Hamden Park in Glasgow and uh, my uncles used to go to Celtic matches and they took me to the game. I was probably six or seven, maybe a bit younger. Uh, and I never forget walking, you know, we got there late. We always ended up late. The game had started, which was kind of cool because it gave me this memory, of, like getting into the stadium, rushing up the steps to try and see the field for the first time. And just, you know, that moment when I came up the precipice of the steps and I could see the pitch in front of me, floodlit Tuesday and Wednesday night, Celtic, Motherwell, and they're playing there on the field and, and the hairs in the back of my neck stand up now talking about it. But at that time, I just thought, this is it. This is what I want to be. This is 
this is where I'm supposed to be. The love that I had for the game, the passion that I had for uh, for football sort of began on that day. Like it made me realise that was my aspirational moment where I thought, this is what I want. And, and thankfully I had the, the grit and the determination and a little bit of skill to push forward to get that. I, I watched Celtic a lot. Like I said, my family, my mum's family were Celtic fans. So there's some big Celtic players and teams that, that I remember for the past. Um, obviously, Paul McStay and John Collins and these guys, a double winning team in, in 1988 was was pretty incredible. Um, and um, where else would I go? Manchester United, 99, when I was getting a little bit older and they won their treble was was something that I really remember. The invincible, so I start going into my professional career and then I think about teams that were amazing and, and inspired me. The Invincibles, the Arsenal in 2004 that I played against for Leeds um, was was one of the, the highlights of my career and thinking about how good that team were and how many superstars they had and how difficult it was to, to try and play against them and come away with any sort of... Uh, respect uh, from from a performance was, was so hard. They were so good. Um, Brazil, Brazil 98, everyone remembers that team. And, and obviously France won that World Cup, but just the, the Ronaldo incident is, is, is etched in my brain from that time as well. So uh, I could go on and on. Um, so many memories of teams and experiences and goals and moments that just make you dream that little bit more and make you work that little bit harder to, to get to your end goal, which is, is obviously for most players to try and play on that professional stage. And I'm, I'm just pleased that I, I had enough that I managed to do that. You played for several teams in the EPL and, and as well got to play for Scotland, for the national team, which is no small feat by any means. And we were talking before we started recording about how Scotland haven't found much international success at any tournament ever, never progressed out of the group stage, but it doesn't diminish the amount of passion that Scottish fans and people have and the pride that they take in their football team, no matter how good or bad they do, or even in the Scottish Premier League. You mentioned it at the beginning of this answer, talking about how, how just euphoric it was to be at that Celtic game as a little boy and seeing like at six or seven, the pitch lit up on a two zero Wednesday night and just being so enamored by how, how mystical that setting is. And, and when you describe it, it makes me think of, it's like being in a movie. You're like, wow, like, look at this. Even I remember talking with KJ and he was talking about the first moments of watching Italia, Italia 90 and how well England did. And could you imagine like Scotland making the semifinal of the world cup? And like, (laughs) even if they don't win, you're still like, Oh my goodness. Like this is so insane. And you played during an era where there's so many iconic teams and players. You mentioned the Invincibles, Brazil 98, Brazil 02 going and finally winning it all. And then Italy having their success in 06 after the, the controversy of 2002. Who, is the, who are the three best players you played against? Like guys that were just, you were just so shocked, like almost starstruck on the field when they got within like two meters of you. Yeah. Uh, the first one, Unquestionably, Thierry Henry, uh, when he played for Arsenal, played against them six or seven times. Um, exceptional. I, I played in that game that everyone will remember against the Invincibles for Leeds, where they won 5 0, and, and Henry scored four goals. Um, and he was just he was just unplayable that night. We just could not handle him. He was so good. Uh, his last goal, he was sort of getting tripped, and he still managed to. to kind of stabbed the ball over the shoulder of Paul Robinson, our goalkeeper, in and in the back of the net. And um, yeah, most times I played against him, he was phenomenal. And I actually really enjoyed playing against him here in the US or in North America when I was at Toronto and he was at Red Bulls to near the end of his career and kind of straighten up a little bit of a relationship, my friendship with him and, and get to know him a little bit better. And then the, the, the playing field being a little bit more level because he was getting older at that point and sort of getting to the better of him in a couple of games. So undoubtedly Henry's number one. Um, number two, I'm going to say Wayne Rooney. And I'm going to say because of a number of different things. So I was at a Newcastle game. I was um, probably about, I don't know this for sure, but I think I'm probably four or five years older than Wayne Rooney. And I was at a Newcastle game. I was in the squad. There was like 18, 19. And the youth team was managed by a Geordie legend called Peter Beersley. 
and Peter came back for playing a game at Everton and he said that they had a tough day, they lost 2-0. This 13-year-old kid scored two goals and it was like an under-18 game and I remember thinking, no, you've got that wrong. Like nobody at 13 can play in a U18 game. It's it's impossible. You know, the best you can get is, you know, it's a couple of years up. And he said, no, seriously, his name is Wayne Rooney. And I never really took any reference to the name at the time, but obviously he went on to be one of the greatest English players ever. I played against him in one of his, he, he, I probably played against him twice in his first 20 games. I played against him at Ellen Road for Leeds against Everton. He was unbelievable. He scored a goal. I played against him at St. James's in a League Cup game for Newcastle against Everton. And again, he was he was causing us all sorts of problems. Even at 16, 17, whatever age he was at the time, very young, he was like a man. He, the way he thought about the game was was just miles above the sort of experience that he had. And, and so I always pick him. Uh, just because I got to kind of play him again through periods of his career and, and, and see how he developed, how good he was. And the third one is a bit more difficult. I'm going to choose a Croatian guy called Alan Boxic, who played for Lazio. People might remember him with Lazio, played with the Croatian national team. But he came to Middlesbrough for, for a year or two, played in the Premier League, probably the early 2000s. And I had a game against him at St. James's where I just... He had like size five feet, so his feet were tiny, and he was six foot two, six foot three, had a big frame, and it was like his touch was so sublime, his ability to kind of hold you off with this big frame and and manipulate the football and and, and sort of like uh, the artist that he was with being such a big guy was just like an anomaly. It was it was weird to see and 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 sort of strange to experience how good he was and, and kind of how he looked. He looked like he was going to be a big brute and he was like this magician, you know. So I never forget that one. But yeah, like I mentioned three there, I, I Ruud van Nistelrooy, Drogba, um, you know, I could go on and on. I've I've played against, fortunately for me, some of the best players in, in the history of the Premier League. And I took some of every single experience, but but they three guys and particularly day three sort of experiences stick out to me. I think right off the bat, there's no question that Henri is number one if you played during the era which in which the Invincibles were playing because if any football fan remembers that year in 2004, Arsenal were literally invincible. They were so unstoppable. Henri was, was on God mode every single game. And I don't know if there's any many other Premier League teams that could really match how well they did that year or how many players individual performance in a Premier League season could rival that of Thierry Henry's in 2004. There, yeah, they, but the whole team was stacked too. Like they were amazing. And even if it was a, like Manchester United were obviously still good and Chelsea, you, Liverpool, you name it. Liverpool literally won the Champions League the next year, but it, within, within the same era, there was just something different about that team. And it's just, it's crazy to think of how big the range is of all the players that you would go up against and how each of them would have something different and unique about themselves. And I think that's what makes playing the game more interesting than maybe the wins and the losses is looking back and saying, wow, I saw Henri in person. People watched from the stands, but you got to be on the field and really understand how amazing he was. And I know people will always jaw when it comes to talking about, oh, I'm better than this football or this guy, he sucks or whatever. But when you go out there in the field, even if you're on a team that's maybe a, a minnow in the, in the terms of the Premier League, it's still a man's game with just an incredible level of talent. I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, if you think back to the three players I chose, I never, I never said about any game where maybe I dominated an excellent player. You always think of the losses. You always think of the experiences where, you know, you're racking your brain. How am I going to handle this guy? This guy's got too many answers for me. Like, I just, I don't know how to handle him. And so... You know, a lot of people look back and, and and we know it's crazy passionate sport and, you know, there's a lot of rivalry and stuff like that. And people say, oh, you remember that time this guy gave you a you know, hard time, he scored a hat trick. And, and you say, yeah, I'm, I definitely remember it. And I'm privileged that I was actually out there experiencing that because I can talk to you for 30 minutes here on what it's like to play against Terry Henry, but I can never capsulate like exactly what it feels like you know it's 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 
harder than you can imagine. I always say it like, you know, if you think a guy's a good player, he's a very good player in real life. And if you think he's very good, he's exceptional. And if you think he's exceptional, like Messi, Neymar, Mbappe, Henri, these guys, they're out of this world. Like you, you cannot believe how good they actually are until you're standing there next to them and you're experiencing their, their, their greatness. So um, it's a great point to make. And it's, it's the memories that you, you take when you retire, like the, the experiences of playing against someone that good as the things you remember, you know, and then fortunately if you've had some, some success, you remember that as well, but you don't remember the day you kind of marked Van Nistelrooy at the game. You just, you remember the, the tragedy of the hard game, you know, but the, the sort of bonus, uh, how that felt like, yeah, I think that's a great point. You even just mentioned some of the players. I love the way that you put it about how, oh, if you think they're really good, they're exceptional. If you think they're exceptional, they're actually out of this world. And I know that people in all sports, but football in particular, love, love talking about the Messi versus Ronaldo debate. They love to beat it to death and say, oh, well, Messi won the Copa America, so now that's the equivalent of the Euro. Or, oh, well, Ronaldo won this first, so or his age or this goal or this team. But the bottom line is how many times in history have we seen two players that are this out of this world playing at the exact same time within the exact same age range playing against each other on the club stage tons of times you very very rarely see it whenever people compare eras it's hard but you don't really you can't sit there and say well if Ronaldo played in the 70s Brazil or if if Pele played in the 80s or whatever like it didn't happen you can never sit there and say that this would have been for certain because you'll never, you'll always just wonder what if, whereas like Messi and Ronaldo, there's comparable data and that you would see them play against each other. But again, it's not to sit there and critique and say, well, Ronaldo's not good because Messi's good. Or one has to be, one has to be better than the other, or one is really good and the other cannot be really good. There's no crossover. Like that's, to me, that's just so insane. Like you have to appreciate how amazing they are. And the fact that you get to just even watch this. Yeah. Uh, How do you compare them? Uh, How do you compare a, a Lamborghini and a Ferrari? It's impossible. They're supercars. They're like, they're both amazing. Like, it's a preference. You, you maybe like the shape of a Lamborghini better than a Ferrari, or you like the noise, or you like the color, or you like the interior. There's just like these small little preferences that as human beings, we go one against the other. But when you try and analytically compare the, the, the data, the goals, the assists, it's really hard to distinguish between these two guys because they're so close to each other. And the fact that they're so close to each other, I believe, and this is where I think that real respect comes between Ronaldo and Messi, they know they could never have been themselves without each other. There's no way that Messi would have got to the heights he got to if he never had Ronaldo and vice versa. And I think Ronaldo always had that little bit of chip in his shoulder to push himself more physically and in the gym and professionally to be the best he can be, knowing that that was the only way to, to hang on the coattails of this just mercurial talent and messy and, and, and a kind of once-in-a-lifetime natural talent. And so uh, as a preference, I never like to choose. It's, it's just like so hard and, and so sort of relevant to say one's better than the other when you look at the, the overall package of a professional football player. And it's just, it's just one of the things where you say, well, I enjoy watching Messi because I enjoy watching somebody just glide by people for fun and, and you know, the flicks and tricks and finishes that he comes up with. And, and, and that's me. But someone else might just love the power and the, the focus and drive of Ronaldo, you know, and, and I certainly respect that. So, um, yeah, I, I just really think they would just never have been one with the other and, and that's why they're, they're so grateful. They've pushed each other to be the best two players of all time. And, and the other thing that football fans understand too is like to sit there, even compare within countries and say, well, oh, Messi will never be as good as Maradona because he didn't win the World's Cup or we'll never hold him in the same regard. Because like, do you know how hard it is to win the World's Cup? Do you know how many times a team like Germany made the final in a row before they finally won? 82, they lost. 86, they lost. 90, they finally got over the hump. Or Brazil, how many years that they didn't make the World Cup final? And people regard Brazil as the best team on earth. Or Italy, winning the Euro. How many years had it been since Italy won the Euro? 1968. So it had been over 50 years. 
or England even getting to a final. When was the last time they made the final? 66. They hadn't even yeah. come close. Like they'd only come close twice since in 90 and 2018. So that's part of what makes it magical to like witness these players do amazing things. Because if you could come from a nation like Scotland, like I bet you wish you could say, Oh man, I, I, I was so happy to see my team lose to the world cup semifinal. Like we got, we got there as a player, you'd be honored to have been in that position rather than, well, we never, never even got the chance. Uh, it's a team sport as well. So when you start to try and compare who's the best, uh, what they've achieved with an international team or a club team, it's, it's absolutely crazy. You know, like I think Danny Alves won his, was it his 44th title at the Olympics there, which is just incredible, 44 titles. But, and I don't mean this in a slight, playing devil's advocate, he was playing with Xavi and Esther and Messi for, you know, I don't know, maybe maybe 30 some and maybe 40 of the titles. So, of course, he had an advantage. Now, he's good enough to play in probably the best club side that we've ever seen. I'm taking nothing away from him as a player, but... In a team sport, it's 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 a bit crazy to start to rate players because of what they've they've won and they've achieved, and um, you know this stuff about Messi not being the greatest because he, he he's never achieved so much with Argentina. He, he's came to the, the edge, uh, you know, it was an extra time in the World Cup and in, uh, in fourteen against Germany. It was two penalty losses, I believe, in the Copa America against Chile. He's obviously just achieved it where he just crushed every metric assists and goals and he won every single one he was the most influential player in the tournament in the cop america just there and as he wins it you've still got people saying well you know it's a 10 team tournament and it's harder to win the euros yet ronaldo won the euros where they drew every game of the group stage they sort of squeezed through the knockouts they got battered in the final if we want to be honest where he got substituted and they they somehow won the game with an elder strike you know like it's it's sort of like, but I don't take that away from Ronaldo. I, I know his influence and his, his levels. And, and to me, it's just another thing that you can you can tick off because it's another attribute, his determination, his grit, his influence over other players. So um, the point I'm trying to make is that, um, you know, individuals should be looked at over the body of their work, the body of their career, and they shouldn't they quite be judged on what they win. I think that there's there's something to be said about this being a team sport and um, and the fact that, you know, certain players get to play in exceptional teams needs to be recognised. Of course. And even with your work, you've recently become the CEO of Best Athletes as well. You've been doing a lot of work at the Horizon Leader Group. So you, as a former footballer, understand that it's important to implement we talk about Christine Sinclair as well, just being a team player and really stressing that point because how many people get a chance to play on generational teams like Danny Alves did with Xavi, Iniesta and Messi? Very, 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 very few people in the entire world can ever do that. So, so to lead into that, you've been involved with Best Athletes now for just a few months and you've been involved with Horizon Leader Group for quite a while now. What are some of the goals that you have with your involvement in youth soccer to help it grow in the country? And what are some of the things that you've taken from your experience as a player that you try to instill in youth footballers? Yeah, I think it ties into our Olympic chat there and, and, and what kind of effect it's going to have on the game. And, and it's certainly going to have that moment for thousands, millions of kids where they, they think, oh, well, I want to do that and I want to achieve that. And a lot of them, unfortunately, don't have that mentor or that sort of, inspiration to go and do it so best athletes is to try and democratize youth sports and it's to try and say we will help you by giving you this platform to assess yourself to compare yourself to um, strive to be better and to improve to then market yourself and recruit yourself to get to the highest level that you possibly can so we're a, we're a data analytics company in, in youth sports we're, we're starting in soccer for obvious reasons a lot of our our uh, founding partners and in, in, in early uh, management have a background in soccer, but it will be applicable to uh, hockey and basketball and lacrosse and rugby. And, and it's, it's built around these assessments. So you've got physical, you have mental, and you have technical, tactical assessments that allow you to see where you stand and where you need to improve. And then eventually, once you get to the right ages, then you can obviously connect with coaches and uh, and connect with schools to, to help yourself be recruited. So 
it's it's allowing democratizing the space, I guess, allowing kids to take matters into their own hands and not rely on that that one important person seeing you on a specific pitch. We believe this is going to be the uh, the, the benchmark and the uh, the sort of uh, breeding ground for recruitment in North America. We think all coaches and and players and teams will be here eventually, and they'll they'll use the metrics that we've designed as, as the benchmark to, to, like I say, succeed and to get forward in the game. And and so big things going there. We're at the early stages, but we're, we're getting some serious traction and we're, we're pleased with that. Uh, you mentioned Horizon Leader Group, which is very quickly, it's a bit more of a career transition business. So it's at the opposite end of the, the scale of what you talked about. The best athletes is at the start and how do you forge a career and, and what is that career and how do you get to the highest level possible? Well, Horizon Leader Groups, you're coming towards the end and you're trying to figure out who you are, what your strengths are and where they can be best utilised in, in the next stage of your life, which, as I know, I haven't retired and went through that as a difficult transition. But once you get through that, doors open up that you would never believe. You know, you, you, you move into different walks of life that the things that you've learned as a soccer player or a hockey player or a basketball player are very applicable in, in business life and in normal life. So our idea is that we, we take athletes, we, we support them, we help them through that process, we give them the tools needed to be successful and to, to find their next calling in life. So uh, doing some great things there as well and really proud of that work. And uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I've never realised for, for, the, for the first time there, I sort of really realised that I've got the beginning with best athletes and then and then the sort of after life with uh, Horizon Leader Group. So uh, I'm proud of it and I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be working with two great companies. I'm a founding partner in Horizon Leader Group and of course uh, CEO of Best Athletes, but super passionate about both and really feel like they can help people succeed the way in which you described how crucial the beginning and the end of that phase of life is, is just phenomenal because with many of the guests I've spoken to, especially here with Canadian and American football, one of the biggest things that people struggle with is loss of identity. You play and you play, it doesn't matter what sport you're playing at a high level and everything's on the line. You're doing everything you can and people are watching you and they're supporting you or sometimes they're not. And then when it's all over, what do people say? First thing, when they see you again, oh, well, you played here, you did this, right? And then it's hard to get over the fact that that part of you is, is no longer true. Like you are no longer that athlete and you were, but now you're a different person and people trying to find out what that means can be super difficult. And if you, I'm sure you even think about Olympians, I, I've seen on social media, a few things talking about the hardest thing about the Olympics is the two weeks after Depends on what country you're from. Some give more prize money, others don't. Some give nothing. People are making debates as to, well, should Olympian athletes get the same salary as a person in X league? But obviously that comes down to dollars and cents and the economics of major sports leagues in North America versus Europe with soccer, et cetera. But making sure that the support system is there at the beginning of the end is so crucial. So I want to acknowledge you for, for doing great work with organizations that are doing everything they can to make sure that people are supported in a holistic approach with when they start and when they finish, because we could sit here all day, probably and name many footballers who have had tragic endings to their careers or those that got meddled with the wrong things or didn't know how to transition out of playing football and ended up experiencing maybe something that wasn't planned or wasn't as good. And it's, it's always sad because I know as a fan of Brazil and Portugal, like I've seen several players where they do super well and at the end, it doesn't end as well as you want it to, or as you think it would. And then it just, just leaves a bad taint on, on their career or what's happened. And it's just tragic because we look to footballers to be inspired. And that's an important part of, of carrying the next generation forward. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, it's hard to, realize when you're in the middle of a career but you know we all are more than an athlete I think a lot of athletes are starting to realize that um some some big time guys and girls are, are doing some great work on what that means you know and and it's um it's it's exactly what you need to kind of figure out and, and come to that realization that you, you have these strengths and these these attributes that you gain through playing sport that that, that really help you to transition into somebody else and try and find that passion. You know, look, 
there's not a lot of things that compare to like playing in front of a packed twenty thousand seat arena or a eighty thousand seat stadium. It's, it's it's pretty unique. It's an incredible rush, incredible experience, and um, unfortunately, we can only do it for so long because you need to be in peak physical condition to 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 be at that level as well as mental. And eventually, you know, it, it's hard to stay at that forever. So. You know, realizing that and knowing people have your back is a big thing. You know, mental health is is a big part of this as well. And we all have our moments, whether you're an Olympian, you've had that crazy high, that Russia, winning that gold and being on every show you can imagine when you get back home and, you know, open top bus, whatever it may be, every you go to your hometown, there's thousands in the streets. And let's be honest, a month later, none of us will be talking about the Olympics. And, and so you go, you feel like you go right down to here, and you wonder how how that happened and, and what you're going to do next. So you've always got to have that bigger picture in mind. Uh, and you've always got to realise that winning something or being part of something great is your moment, to, your fleeting moment, as a good friend of mine says, to market yourself and to, to kind of position yourself for what you want to be and what you want to say, you know? And, uh, and so... We really do a lot of work there. We do a lot of discovery work about who you are, your perception in the outside world, uh, you know, internal tests on what your personality is, how you like to learn, you know, where your strengths and weaknesses are. So you can figure out what decisions need to be made to set you up for success for, you know, beyond playing, which is usually the, you know, more than half your life. You know, you think that, you think you're like, I can remember thinking, yeah, this word retire and everything's like sort of around about the fact that your your life's coming to an end, but you're like 35 years old, 40 years old. It's like, it's crazy. You know, it takes a while to realise that you've got half your life ahead of you and a lot of achievements still to fulfil. So, um, yeah, I love the support. And the work that we're doing there, um, it's it's slowly but surely picking up because, as we know, nearly every athlete needs it. It's just a case of getting to the right people and and, and getting our, our voices out there so people know how we can help. Of course. That's the only way to go forward is to build brick by brick. And you guys are taking a strong initiative on doing that and bringing the sport together or multiple sports together to really help athletes because mental health, is becoming more increasingly important as time goes on and is getting more attention and exposure, but as it should have the entire time, because it's as important as our physical health. And if you look at the, the struggles that athletes have had with not being there mentally, like it's enough to be there physically, but if you're not there mentally, then it's very difficult. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's a big thing. So yeah, you need, you need that, you need all parts of you, your your mind and your body to be healthy. And um, that's another thing, you know, even the physical side that you drop off of your physical output. So it affects your, your mentality as well. And that's, you know, again, in the learnings, uh, when you retire, we, we have a group of people that have been through it. We have a team of 70 plus between athletes and mentors and uh, business executives, we have a robust team that are there to support. And like I said, we're on the verge of some really big things and excited to see what it takes us. Well, Stephen, we're getting towards the end of our time on today's episode. So I want to ask you a few wrap up questions to have some fun before we part for today. Okay. Sounds good. Who is the best player from England and who's the best player from Scotland of all time? All time from Scotland. It's Kenny Dalglish. Uh, England's a bit harder for me. Um, I would say Bobby Charlton. You can't go wrong with that answer. <laughs> to be honest, I was between Gaza, Paul Gascoigne, and Bobby Charlton, but I think I think I have to go Bobby Charlton. Who is your favorite manager of all time? My favorite manager is Chris Hutton, uh, who was my manager at Birmingham City. He's now at Nottingham Forest. And um, was that the question? My favorite, yeah, yeah. Your favorite, your favorite, yeah. Course. Chris, Chris, Chris was great. I love working with Chris, he was a mixture of uh, you know, experience and, and uh, empathy, and then also determination and grit and tactics. I love the great manager. Now, a similar question, but with a twist who do you think, at least in the time that you've been alive and watched football and played football, 
is the best manager that there ever was in your lifetime? Pep Guardiola, no question. Pep has done so many amazing things, and it's he's done so many amazing things across so many continents. So it's he's a genius. He's a genius. The guy's a genius. He just thinks about the game on another level, and he comes up with tactics and ways of playing that are just just incredible. And he gets the best out of players. He improves everybody he works with. He's done it in what three three uh, leagues now and three different teams and yeah, exceptional. But there's a lot of good ones, but Pep's the best. If there was one footballer who has passed on that you could have a chance to sit down and talk with and just have one day to interact and do whatever you like to get to know them and to pick their brain, who would it be and why? Ah, uh, wow. Um, probably Maradona. Um, I think I think just his mercurial genius and you know some ways flawed character. I, I don't know if all my chat would be about football, but I think it would be about his his other stuff as well. But just just he has that, you know, that aura about him and that presence that just I think everybody would like to have spent some time in his company just to see what made him so special. In the time that you've been alive, who would you say is the best team to have ever won the World Cup? Oh, wow. The time I've been alive. So I guess I can include 82, even though I was only two. Um, I would say from World Cups, I remember. Um, wow, it's a great question. Um Mm, it's a tough one, this one. Yeah, maybe Brazil 2002. I'd probably go Brazil 2002. For, for Flair, I, I would try to think of a team that had a little bit of everything. I'd say Brazil 2002. I mean, that, like, I won't argue with you there. That team, I was even saying to, to people I know, asking all my friends who come from different backgrounds and ethnicities, like, who would you say is the best player of all time from your country or which team is the best World Cup winner from your country? And when I think of Brazil, I know everyone talks about 1970 and they were so amazing, but like there's something about 2002, I think that is a little underrated. The way Ronaldo played and the comeback from 98 and even the game against England, like that game was crazy in and of itself, like the Ronaldinho goal over David Seaman and Michael Owen opening the scoring. Like who would have thought, like could you imagine what England fans were thinking? Like, whatever time early in the morning or the day they're watching and like we're leading against Brazil. This is really happening right now. David Beckham, this is his revenge tour. Like after his fall, his disgrace from 98, this is when it's all going to come together. And then Rivaldo slides one home and then Ronaldinho just stuns an entire country. That's yeah. I, I can't argue with him in Brazil 2002. That's definitely yeah. some team that there, they were something, but the final question I have for you is this. If there was one team that you could have played for during your career as a footballer, you could put yourself on them no matter what. You transfer yourself there like no one could stop you. <laughs> Who would you want, which club would you want to be a part of and why? Anywhere in the world. Oh, wow. It's a question I think we've always went through. The one club that you maybe could have signed with, um, I would have to say Barcelona. Barcelona, you know, sort of 8, 9 to, to 11 or 12, you know, it was just, obviously I was playing, I was in the peak years of my career. Um, so, yeah, when I think back to that team, the, the style under Pep, the quality players that we've mentioned at the, earlier on this podcast, Messi, Iniesta, Xavi, um, yeah, that would have been quite, quite something. And I think that's a great way to wrap up for today because the double treble is something that has never been done and might not ever be accomplished since. So with that, Stephen, I want to thank you for having been on today's episode. I want to acknowledge you for all the great work you've been doing in the football community with grassroots here in Canada and across North America. I've really enjoyed chatting and reminiscing with you about so many great footballers, teams, and all the experiences that you've had playing against some of the greatest players that there were in the Premier League. Thank you so much for having been on today's episode. It was a great, great pleasure. Thank you, Matthias. It was a pleasure for me too. 
Well, thank you for listening to today's episode with TSN football analyst, Stephen Caldwell.